Welcome. Bonjour. Vous écoutez le podcast Dirty Feet sur les ondes de No More Radio. You're listening to the Dirty Feet podcast on the No More Radio Network. Nous sommes vos animateurs et animatrices. We are your hosts, Alison Burns, J.D. Papillon et Stéphanie Morin-Robert. Listen in. Écoutez. We're going to move you. again for another interview uh, which is very exciting so um, you're listening to the Dirty Feet podcast and I'm here with Paul Chambers and he's going to do uh, a workshop this week um, at Studio 303 where he'll be teaching about lighting design so uh, Paul graduated from John Abbott College in the professional theatre program specializing in design and he became involved in working with dance companies um, in 2005 and he'll be continuing to work with dance companies for a long time now because that's sort of where he's concentrating his energy is um, working in, in lighting design uh, for dance and then also as a part of a collective with David Alexandre Chabot um, where they're working on a little bit more um, works based on set and design that start from that and work into more of a performance. So we're going to talk about all those things. So welcome to the podcast. Hi. And um, I'm really interested to understand what draws you to dance specifically in terms of doing the lighting. Um, that's a good question. I think for for dance mainly, my interest was that there was a there's a current preoccupation of treating the venue as the container for the work. Uh, mm. And for lighting, that's really interesting because you're not limited to a stage or a box, but really actually a, a full three-dimensional space. Um, and not that that's not true for theater or opera or anything like that, but I just feel in dance with the lack of uh, set designs and also in smaller productions, uh, lighting has a very great role to play in kind of transmitting uh, ideas or themes throughout the piece. So you think the preoccupation is... Um, like, do you mean that people are creating works for spaces definitely and also um considering the space and treating the space when they go into a theater and, and uh. kind of uh, occupying it showing it bare there's a there's a sort of interesting trend of this kind of work being made yeah there's been some really interesting work in the last couple of years that i've seen like fred gravel lowering the lighting rig down for ainsi parler mm -hmm. um yeah there's been some really uh, just recently, George Stamos stripping the stage uh, at La Gorra. Yeah. That was fantastic. Mm -hmm. So I guess as for when I make work, I think a part of what both Allison, who is, I mean, obviously my co-host, and then I were both thinking was, okay, so what? what's the starting point often when you begin to work on one of these works? Is it let's look at the space that the work will be performed in. Um, do you get started with the artists while they're actually developing the work? Definitely. I think um, for my process, I usually try to go see rehearsals really early on and also have meetings early on to kind of understand what the sort of goal or aim of the production is or what the thoughts and ideas behind it are, uh, as well as seeing the actual movement and, and uh, trying to understand also its aesthetic or whatever um, it's trying to convey. Mm. And then from there, then also looking at, okay, wh what's the context that we're being presented in? You know, are we in a festival, in a large venue, in a very intimate showing? Is the audience on one side, all around us? You know, how do we... All these questions then kind of come up, and I just think that there's a really interesting dialogue right now about those questions. Are you interested in working specifically with more non-traditional spaces, or does it matter to you whether it's uh, proscenium theater or not? I don't really have a preference on where shows are presented. I think that in my own work, uh, I'm, I'm interested in developing pieces that can work in any space, and so mm. the idea that they are versatile. 
um, or have a, a, a way of being malleable to work in different spaces. Okay. So I guess that my, I'm interested, we're jumping around a bit, but I'm interested in the, in the lighting design workshop specifically. And did you develop that as, because you felt like it was necessary, like people needed that information? Um, it actually, that, that was a realization that came to me a little later on, actually, um, uh, back when I was working at 303, uh, as their technical director, Miriam Genestier, uh, the artistic director had suggested, said, oh, you know, you, you are really passionate about lighting. Would you want to do a lighting workshop? We have a lot of groups and artists that come into the space and that, you know, have access to our lights and our equipment, but not necessarily the, the tools or even the sort of the background or ideas to kind of even know what to do with it and so the first year I just did this course and it, it was a, a quite a good success we were really impressed with it and I, I was really happy to hear back from participants years later I was on tour in Vancouver and actually met a technician working there and he said hey how's it going and we hadn't seen each other in maybe six or seven years and he had taken my first lighting class oh. ever at 303 and he decided after that to go into theater school and then now is working as a technician in Vancouver. Oh. So it was really great to see this sort of impact that it had on this um, young man who's now working in the arts as well. And then similarly with choreographers, I realized that there's a really interesting link going on with choreographers coming to take the workshop and then after working with designers and then having a... Um, a much more vested interest in how the lighting looks for their piece, mm -hmm. having a bit more uh, words, images to describe what they're looking for and try to translate that in a way to designers. Mm -hmm. So you've been doing the workshop since 2008. Yeah. And it happens now every year. Yeah. And do you see that people, like, do people come back? Um... No, I've, I've usually it's a quite a small group and it's a lot of new faces every time and it's okay. a mix. There's people that come from theater, uh, dance, there are people who are uh, st studying in photo but that are interested in how lighting works on stage and kind of understanding how that those things could be complementary. So there's kind of a, a really wide mix, uh, sometimes just dancers that aren't even producing their own shows but that have an interest in, in making things or working with light in different ways. So. There's, um, yeah, there's quite interest, which is great. Yeah. So in the time that you um, were working at 303 and at Tangent, that's a lot, I mean, often, from my understanding, a lot of the companies who are coming through those spaces, um, or the choreographers that are coming through those spaces, aren't working with an enormous amount of, um, like, financial resources. And do you think that that aspect of it has an impact on the way that they choose to do design elements like costume and light and set? Yeah. I mean, very often we're, we're usually limited by our budgets, not our imagination. Um, and so there's a, there's a slew of productions that I work on where if, depending on how the funding results go, that there, there's a situation where we go, well, we'll either have this much money to spend on design or other elements or you know, actually giving everybody a little bit more money or mm -hmm. we're in a situation where unfortunately we have to make cuts and where, you know, design elements are usually things that do get chopped early mm -hmm. on. <laughs> yeah. So, and then in that role um, as technical director, were you in a position where you're doing a lot of design for people as they arrived or were they arriving with their design and you, it was more of an execution? I was... I was interested in design before I had um, gotten to Tangente, and when mm -hmm. I started working at Tangente as a technical director, um, I realized that there were certain shows that came to the venue that didn't have any designers, and that I was in a situation where I was around and said, well, this show seems quite interesting, I can just light it for you, and also sort of helping companies that had less means to be able to have a light designer on place, so kind of, you know, um, and a lot of venues do this, they'll kind of offer someone from their crew that they'll say, well, you know, I, our head electrician or our technical director could, you know, step in and do the lighting for you in the way that you go to a small festival sometimes and there's a technician there, they don't have a designer, but they have a technician. Um, and I started doing more designs for dance that way and kind of building a name and making uh, friends and allies in the dance community that were interested in the work I was doing and that mm -hmm. I was interested in theirs and then kind of built from there. Okay. Yeah, because I guess that, I mean, just from like a totally self-interested point of view, I'm interested to pick your brain about, about um, 
the way light is specifically, um, I don't want to say useful, but uh, important in dance because I find like the, when I go and see a theater work, um, the way the lighting is used is often different than in, to me than the way it's being used in a dance work. And when I'm thinking about the way I want to light work that I've made, often my preoccupation is how um, how will we see the the body on stage? Like mm-hmm. how will the dancers be? Um, like what will the lighting do to the way that they look, mm-hmm. basically? But I feel like that's kind of a very first level concept, and that there's so much else. But I don't, I mean, I would want to know, like, what else, what else can light do besides that? Because I, I guess that when I, when I light pieces, then I don't think much beyond that. I mean, and this is something that I, I talk about in the course at 303. Mm-hmm. Um, one of them is, you know, what does lighting design do? Like, you know, it, we all understand that it, it's lighting the piece. It can kind of enhance it somehow. But mm-hmm. what is that enhancement? What are we doing with lighting? Um, and so I really go into the idea of like creating an environment, whether it's natural or sort of, uh, supernatural, Mm -hmm. uh, the idea of composition and using light and shadow color and form to kind of shape either the bodies of the dancers on stage or the space in the room that it's in the idea of setting a mood, how that works and, and affecting the audience's, uh, psychological condition, Mm -hmm. the idea of punctuations or the way that you can reinforce themes or ideas with lighting. So this idea that lighting, as you're saying, is it can go beyond just lighting a piece and, and it being just about visibility. It can be about a lot of other sort of degrees of, um, yeah. So what would you say, like, for um, a, a choreographer who has the, their, their first opportunity to actually work with a designer, what kinds of things do they bring to that meeting so that that can go successfully? Yeah, I mean, I think that in creating a working relationship uh, between a director and a designer, a choreographer and a designer, is really based on communication. Um, The idea to be able to communicate, whether it's with your words or with imagery, or, you know, I tell people, I was like, you know, I... If I'm working on a dance show and the choreographer brings me an image from a magazine that they're reading and it's it for them conveys something particular about the colors or the mood or something about the piece, then that's something that's really useful to share with mm. the design team. Okay. Um, so I really kind of stress this idea of like getting used to also drawing and trying to draw your ideas, um, mm. writing about them, speaking about them, and kind of creating a dialogue. Um, and the, obviously getting... Uh, the right terminology and words and things like this is something that in the course we treat a bit for that reason to kind of demystify lighting a bit because it is something that is um, intangible. It's something that is very ethereal and that, that we can't really grasp with our hands. Uh, and therefore, they're, they're, I find it's more difficult to speak about than something that's like, you know, solid and that you can touch and has a texture and that is, uh, yeah, in a sense, more tangible. Yeah, well, and I I wonder if um, in some of the processes I've been involved in, we've introduced elements of lighting very early on in the process, like while the choreography is being created, Um, or, and the same thing with the the costumes or whatever. And I don't think that everybody has access all the time to a, like a technical residency, um, which is... I mean, obviously you need all of those lights in order to play with the lights. Mm -hmm. Um, But what do you think that somebody could do that maybe who didn't have that technical residency, like how can they begin to imagine what light can do to their work in the, in the, while the choreography is being created? Um, I mean, that's a great question. I mean, I think that it's a difficulty that is with lighting, which is it's a very hard thing to make, uh, scale model of to, mm-hmm. to work on at home uh, in a sense. I mean, I can do the lighting plans and kind of, you know, make design choices at home, but I, I can't experiment with the equipment at home. And there's a, uh, that's always been, like you say, a, um, a challenge because you need a technical residency or you need time in a theater or in a space to actually try ideas out, see it with your own eyes because it's such a visual art form. Um, and I would say with, without that, without a technical residency, the best thing you can do is see, uh, 
work like uh, mm. to, to try and go see more work and, and understand things about it if you see a lighting that you like try to understand why or try to find the designer and or the choreographer and make a conversation and say hey I really like that I'm wondering how you made this thing or you know what were you preoccupied about you know these mm. questions are things that um, unfortunately not a lot of designers get asked um, mm. and I think as, as much for a set designer or a costume designer these are kind of really valid sort of decisions that people made about a production mm -hmm. and that there should be sort of a, a, an easier dialogue. Um, yeah. And so I think that with this course and other sort of initiatives, I'm, I'm trying to make people much more sensitive uh, to lighting and to design. Okay. So you've worked with lots of different artists at this point. Um, you know, you've been working with public recordings with Lara Kramer, uh, you worked obviously with a lot of people while you were at Tangente and at 303. I'm interested to know what differences in, in processes, like how does your process change as it encounters another person's process? Uh, it actually tr changes quite a bit. Um, most recently, uh, I did a collaboration with uh, Katie Ward, a mm -hmm. piece called Infinity Donut that was presented last year. Um, and it, it was interesting because when I went to rehearsal, I, I was really interested in how the piece was made. Um, and I wouldn't say more interested, I, no, I would say more interested in how the piece was made than the result of what was created. Mm. Um, and that's not to take anything away of what was created. I think what was created was absolutely beautiful. But what interested me was how the lighting could follow the same uh, course or the same... Um, path that the choreographer took and so Katie Ward in the way that she created the piece I tried to create a lighting score that was created with the same constraints mm -hmm. so this idea about things always moving and I said okay how can the lighting always move you know the idea of the 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 piece that the lighting is creating because the piece was about connectivity um, it was like how the lighting could be more connected to the piece and so one of the choices we made was Katie and myself were actually on stage in the space the audience was on stage in the space with the dancers and then what we realized is if I'm controlling the lights from inside then I'm really I'm not looking at it from the outside the way I'd normally look at a piece I'm looking at it from within and suddenly having the exact same reaction as the audience and kind of using that to gauge um, the production and from night to night the lighting score actually changed tremendously I gave myself a lot of possibility for mm. making decisions in the same way that somebody on, on stage dancing would be improvising um, so it became something that we, we were concerned about making performative because also the role was on stage and so it's like you couldn't just sit there at a computer mm -hmm. it would be much more interesting if you were moving sliders and kind of shifting and in a sense being choreographed as well and so this kind of developed over again this piece we were lucky we had a residency and so we went to France did a residency and then came back and presented it in Canada um, okay. twice in St. John's and then Montreal. That sounds fascinating. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, it was a really great experience. And nice to also think about the lighting as connecting through the work through the process and not just through the performance that is created. Mm -hmm. And not um, sort of like plaqué, like mm -hmm. on top, yeah, like absolutely. an icing, mm -hmm. like it's like part of the cake. Yeah, trying to make it, yeah, yeah, fit in in a way that it is, it is necessary because it, it's interwoven. Interesting. So um, you've also worked with Parts and Labour Dance, mm -hmm. and I know that they toured some of their work recently. And so does some of the stuff that you create with them end up having to be altered when they tour? Definitely. I mean, especially with um, smaller companies, usually the, the reality is that the budgets for touring aren't that big. So anything with a a set design that would need transport or anything like that or even a show with an, an, an insane amount of lights would mm. need to be reduced. Um, Parts and Labor will be doing a production that we're going to have to reduce and, and alter the lighting for a tour uh, next year. Mm. Um, and similarly with a show that's touring this year um, called Dossity Der Mama, uh, the first creation of it had uh, you know somewhere around a hundred lamps mm. uh, and we're going to be touring it in the Maison de la Culture this year. Uh, but in some you know venues where they have half that, if not maybe thirty, so thirty percent of what we had. So how that can how you can still make the lighting design live in that 
scenario uh, is always a challenge. Like how you, it's like scalable. Yeah. <laughs> lighting design. Interesting. So like a, like a piece with a hundred lamps, what does that look like? It always looks different. I mean, that's a funny thing. Like, I mean, some of the most beautiful things I've seen that other designers have done, I mean, sometimes they're done with like five lamps and it's the whole thing and you even one and you go, wow, that's outstanding. And then sometimes it takes, you know, a hundred or more to, to do something that also looks um, really impressive. So I'd, I'd say it really depends. Like the look is always different. Um, and that I don't think about, I mean, when I'm thinking about technical sort of constraints, obviously the lamp count and things like this are a concern, but when designing, it's, it's really about the, the, the final image and how you can make a show look and feel and have people react to your design. Um, yeah, regardless of how big or small the, the, the intervention you're making is. Mm. Sometimes, you know, it's the same thing with set, you know, your interventions actually maybe you know, one rock on stage, but that rock, if it's, you know, really pertinent, it could be a really beautiful, you know, sober design choice. Yeah. Did you see La Pudeur des Espergues by Daniel Levillé? No, I missed that one. I saw the last one. So did you okay. do? One of the things I found fascinating about the lighting design for that work. So the, um, the work is, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it was several years ago that I saw it for five men and one wo woman. Mm -hmm. And um, the men are performing movements that, uh, that repeat pretty often, and they're very uh, matter-of-fact in their interpretation, like very straightforward. There's not a lot of um, uh, like emotional overtone, necessarily, mm -hmm. to the movement. And then the, the score is Chopin. Um, and I was fascinated. I think it's the first time, and I, I saw it while I was still in school, I think it was the first time I ever really noticed the lighting design on a work. Like sometimes you almost, it's almost like it comes as a package deal for the spectator. You don't even realize it's there. It's like when there's, there's good food, nobody notices. And when there's bad food, everybody notices, you know, it's, so there's, what amazed me about it is the designer had made some choices so that it looked as though maybe there were clouds passing over the work because there was just these really subtle, like t maybe 10, 15% shifting of lighting over time. And so there was like little shadows emerged and then they disappeared. And there was a sense of passing of time in the lighting without there being really these dramatic changes until very late on in the piece. And then things quite ch shift quite deeply. Mm -hmm. And I think that it was just, I was, I was amazed. And I think that ever since then, <laughs> I've just like been trying to reproduce that lighting design over and over again. So I wonder, like, do you know maybe how that kind of thing would have been achieved? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's, there's, um, there's interesting sayings about sort of lighting design. And one, mm -hmm. one of them is around the idea that, that if it's unnoticeable, then it's really pertinent or it's really served its mm. part because it, it, it was kind of like, part of the whole production and it was, it didn't stand out as something being wrong. Mm. Um, I always find that's a bit of a, an odd statement just because in some circumstances you want the lighting to, you know, mm -hmm. pop out earlier, you were just telling me about a uh, rock show you saw, you know, and that's a yeah. case where like a great lighting design is not the one that you don't see. It's actually the one that you see very much. Mm -hmm. you know? So this idea that for me, I, I always kind of thought about that saying and said, well, maybe it's more about the, uh, the appropriate lighting you know, and this idea of it not being, not it being not seen or not noticed, but the idea of the appropriate choices go sort of unnoticed or will, you know, seem like the right choices. And this idea that trying to see if you can make the audience believe that you've made appropriate choices for the work. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's a bit like transitions. Yeah. Like, like if you have two sections in the piece and there's a transition in between them, the transition can be many things. It can be, it can be something in and of itself that it sticks out. Mm -hmm. It's like a, a red bar between two white sheets, or it can just be more white stuff in the middle that sort of blends the two things together. And so in the same way, I assume that lighting could work like that. It, yeah. And I mean, sometimes you want transitions to be really noticed and sometimes you want them to be subtle. Sometimes the piece, 
feels too fragmented and the role of the lighting is to kind of help make the whole thing feel more together and sometimes it's the opposite sometimes you need to be able to you know this this show is too similar and needs sort of accents or needs sort of a, a shift or a refresh and the idea that as an audience member sometimes if we're staring at a show and the lighting doesn't change for over an hour you know maybe you could have a couple shifts in there that people don't really notice but are actually letting our eyes refresh in a certain way and mm -hmm. and see things in a different light and that that might be a bit more subliminal but also very effective well and it's almost like thinking about the lighting more in terms of um compositionally mm -hmm. like as a as a like point counterpoint like that kind of like ABA, mm -hmm. whatever, like composition elements. Did, like when you start a lighting design, do you always start the same way? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not very constant in the way that I work. I think that it, it again, changes uh, depending on who you're, you're working with as well, how late you come into the process, whether you're, you're kind of flown in at the end and you're, you're, you're kind of catching up to all the other designers or if you're in a situation where you are creating in tandem with them and the sound and the lighting and the idea that you've already kind of figured how they will influence each other. Um, so it, it's actually very, very different. And also the fact that um, every choreographer is really, I mean, the works are very different. Contemporary dance is something that's actually quite vast as far as what the what the result can be, but also um, I think that the process of all these choreographers is also very different. Some pieces are created very rapidly, some take a longer amount of time, some go through sort of very drastic changes in their creation mm -hmm. process, like others are kind of very focused and have a, a steady pace. So it kind of depends. Those things can affect also the way that I design, but usually, you know, when I sit down to start, it it's really starts from the movement and the ideas. Um, I've, I, my current preoccupation is in designing lighting that lights um, or tries to light sort of not just light the show that we're seeing, but light the ideas that mm. we want to put forward. And so this idea of how do you light an idea, you know, or how <laughs> do you light a, an inspiration or how do you light, you know, an, a totally intangible thing. Um, and so that's kind of my challenge. And, and so e example with, Katie Board was, you know, it was about highlighting her process in some sense, you know, and with different productions, it'll have uh, different roles. When I did, again, Dance de Mama, Maman, the, the, the role of the lighting was, was really big in the piece. The dancers actually interacted with it and had a, it, it served a purpose. And so obviously downsizing that show is a really interesting challenge because of it, the lighting's role already in the production. Do you ever... Um light something and then it goes on tour a year later and you go to look at the design and you think oh no we can't do that like I have to change it uh no I hate that no no it's <laughs> never happened um maybe because either I tour with the show and then I'm working very hard to try and conserve something um or I couldn't tour with the show and somebody else has taken it and then I actually don't get to see it so I don't even get to have this moment of like oh my and also the, the reality is very few contemporary dance works will tour several years. Mm -hmm. So this idea, um, I actually often, when I see the, 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 the closing night performance of a show, I often think this is probably the last time I'm going to see this work, which is kind of a sad thing to say about every work you create. But at the same yeah. time, it's a reality that, that, you know, maybe I'd say 20% of the shows that I'll design will even have a second life in a second theater in the same city before even thinking about touring internationally and all that. So there's a kind of a, yeah. Oh, that's heavy. <laughs> Sorry. No, but it's true. it's true. And we have to say it more often, I think. I, I was just at, um, in attendance, I was very fortunate to be invited to um, go to Les Prix de la Danse. Mm -hmm. And I thought that Melanie de Mer said something really, you could have heard a, like a pin drop after she said it. She won for best the, choreography. Yeah, Fantastic. best best choreography and like extraordinarily her. well deserved. Yeah, three hundred and seventy nine people saw the work. Absolutely, three hundred seventy nine people. Mm -hmm. Right, and you could you just like it was everybody in the room just sort of like recoiled into their seat a little bit, and then she said, you know, maybe we should shoot for more like three thousand. 
something. You know? <laughs> Anything more. Or she's like, I yeah. don't think that, you know, in a population of 8 million people in this province, like, 30,000 people would be, you know, a terrible thing mm-hmm. to shoot for either. Yeah. You know? And I mean, and that's, that's a reality that's based on the funding, but also yeah. on the, the audience, you know? It's, it's not an art form that has the widest audience. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not an extraordinarily popular art. You know? No. No, it's not. That's just true. And I... <laughs> I wonder, okay, so now that, like, circling back around, do you think that there's a way of lighting work to make it more accessible? To make dance as a field more accessible? Well, like, I'll I'll work. (laughs) I mean, like, I don't know. Maybe, like, let's think big. (laughs) Maybe. That would be too big a challenge. I don't think I could sign on for that. Maybe the key is just we need to light everything better. And then be a small fleet of lighting designers (laughs) working on that. But, uh, no, I, I... I, I mean, on the last production we just did with um, Maria and Hanneko, uh, mm. The Paradise, it was just mm-hmm. at Tangent, um, I, this idea of accessibility uh, to the work was, was a question, and not so much the idea that we were trying to dumb it down or, or that, that there was something simpler we needed to do, but this idea that making a proposition that was um, not alienating, um, mm-hmm. and then how the lighting could even have a factor on that whether you know people are lit are they in the dark uh do they you know these things really change how we see a performance if we feel that we're lit or not we will react differently yes um and similarly if it's really bright the show or if it's really dark you know these things really kind of play with our comfort levels and this idea that we were looking at how these things um affect people how colors affect people too how we can Mm -hmm. kind of cheer someone up with color or, or change someone's view of something um, so yeah, these were questions we were looking at while designing that piece. Yeah, and do you see, like, are there trends in lighting design? Hmm. Um, that's a good question. I think that there's... It's hard to tell. I mean, I, I don't see everything, obviously, and mm. and of what I do see, it's quite diverse. So I'd say that, that n- no, there's no trend. Mm. Um... But I mean, I would say that there's designers that have uh, either kind of specialized in a certain look or an aesthetic or, or have kind of refined something. And so that in that case, I, when I see their works, I see that they're continually working or exploring or searching for something. Uh, and that's really pleasant, too, to see people and try to figure out their design process. Yeah, well, I feel like there's... Um... Maybe in more like an American modern dance, there's more of a history, like like Martha Graham, Alvin Ailey, there's more of a history of using set than we necessarily have here. But I also feel like people are moving towards a, a very different idea of what a set design can be also. Mm-hmm. Um, like this sort of modern dance perspective, which is like we have to put some trees on stage so everybody knows we're in a forest. And versus, like, what can we, what kind of objects do we bring with us on stage and how are the objects arranged to create an environment? So there's a question in there somewhere, I promise. Um, And I think my question is, is we've talked a lot about lighting, um, but how much are you working with the objects that land on the stage or in the space? Um, it depends. I mean, on, on different shows, like shows that actually have sets, um, most of them, the, the scenography are things that I've designed as well. Um, and so hopefully I've thought about how to integrate <laughs> the two designs. Um, and sometimes it's more successful than other times. And sometimes I feel that I've, I focus all my energy on the set design and then I'm, I'm having a hard time even lighting my own set and I wish I, there was another light designer that could come and do it, mm. um, which I'm sure I would hate. <laughs> but I think overall, um, no, I think overall with set for me, there's, there's, a, there's definitely an interest to creating sort of um, big, sort of bolder statements with, with uh, either oversized objects or very few elements so tr- working in a certain sense of minimalism um but i kind of call it like a, maybe like a i don't know a 
oversized or sort of a really bold minimalism. So it's mm. kind of a, it doesn't really make sense. But anyway. So what are, what are some works that you've done recently that have this this set element as well as a lighting element? Mm -hmm. Um, last year in February, I worked with Benjamin Camino on a piece called uh, Dark Meaningless Touch. Uh, and that was, the lighting was actually designed by Timothy Rodriguez, mm -hmm. who you guys know. Um, and, uh... We know him pretty well. Yeah, you know him pretty well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, Timothy Rodriguez did this thing, and uh, it, it was um, a massive, massive plywood stage that we built, that the audience was sitting on, uh, and Chris... Uh, Willis, who did the sound design and composition, had actually uh, screwed transducers and speakers under the risers, and the idea that the audience was lying down on this massive sound stage bed mm. um, that would vibrate and move uh, with the sound. And then we we built in collaboration with um, my co-set designer on that production was uh, Jesse Orr, who works with me quite a lot, mm -hmm. and uh, her and I. Um, she was really uh, instrumental in building this sky that we built, which had sort of all these sweeping panels of fabric uh, that kind of were a ceiling above the audience and, and uh, could actually also lower and change throughout the production so that there was a sort of sense of being almost like under the sheets. Hmm. See, like, who doesn't want to see that? That sounds like a totally immersive experience. It was, and it was a nice space. Like, it was a really cold winter, and it was really nice to go in that room that was super warmly lit and then had this, like, really warm smell of the wood also that was raw and untreated. And then the, 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 this kind of fabric sky, so you couldn't even see the theater ceiling. So there was this really nice sense, yeah, that you were in sort of a, a womb or a, a belly of some sort of mm. space. Yeah, and I think that this um, idea, you know... Um, people sometimes talk about dance as being like a complete art because it involves the body, it involves um, this element of set and lighting, like there's there's almost a cinema, cinematographic uh, mm -hmm. sense mm -hmm. to it uh, because of all these elements being united and especially as people are integrating more sound elements and even text elements into their work, then there's just such a possibility for this complete environmental feeling. Mm -hmm. So do you, like, is that the kind of thing that you're excited about in, when, we go, when we start to go in that direction versus something that might be more like traditional lit from the front kind of thing? I mean, I think that there's uh, there's a place for both types mm. of works to live. I think that it's exciting to go see works in either found spaces or spaces that have been treated in a particular way, as much as I can go see a show that, that is in that frame, that is in a proscenium arch, and that I also think is equally beautiful um, and and brings other qualities. Um, and actually, with David X. Shabbat, who I do uh, cha designs with, mm -hmm. Um, him and I are designing a piece in January together for um, Audrey Bergeron called Par le Chat de l'Aiguille, which will be at Cinquième Salle with uh, the presenter as Dans Cité. And uh, we're both doing lighting and set together. And one of our biggest design choices that we've kind of committed to is this idea of creating a, a forced proscenium that's actually very low. So almost, you know, just for three or four feet above the dancer's heads. So the idea that we're looking at something that's extraordinarily wide, but very low, and actually to get that um, cinematographic sort of look. Mm, yes, because um, the Sekim Sal is... Um, it's it's very, quite wide anyway. Yeah, it's and very so wide, we but it, kind of it like, has... Let's make it more wide. <laughs> some, some height to it, yeah. you know? Like there's mm -hmm. a sense of... You're very close to the, the scene, and yeah, but it's... It's pretty big. Yeah, and the, 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 I think the room, and here's another way how we treat the room, but the room can get very overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And so what we thought was to make really a sort of very clear proposition of where the work lives and actually here say, no, it's not about the space. This work could live anywhere, but look at what we've created inside this envelope or inside this this viewfinder mm. to create. And the idea of also creating all that masking was to hide a lot of effects that we wanted to create with the lighting and the idea that we don't see the sources, but we'll just see the dancers, the space, and the, this kind of um, bare space with 
as little as amount of uh, external light as possible. So the idea mm. that it looks really sort of um, clean. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about what is it like to not just collaborate with people sort of out, like not outside your discipline, but I guess like choreographers and whatever, but somebody who has the same background as you or has similar background to you and and how do you collaborate like how do you make decisions in that situation it's funny um when uh, people ask me about my collaboration with david uh they ask are, are you extraordinarily different and your ideas complement each other in a sort of weird way do you fight the whole time how yeah how do you make decisions and uh I'd say that we actually are extraordinarily similar in our, mm. um, and it wouldn't, I wouldn't even say in aesthetics because I, I don't think I'm concerned so much in having a specific aesthetic because I want each piece to look, uh, different and I want each piece to look really, the lighting to look pertinent to that piece and that piece alone. Um, but this idea that we have very similar, uh, we make very similar decisions and in the way that that we very often realize that we agree on almost everything. And so it's nice to have somebody back you on decisions, but then also there are places where we can compliment each other and, you know, I'll go a little further and I'll say, well, why, we, why don't we think of this? Or he'll say, well, I have access to this. What, we, what about this? And there's a, there is sort of a, it's more like a relay, you know, you don't talk about your teammates on a relay mm -hmm. and say, well, I'm the faster one or he brings this or it's kind of like, well, we're both working really hard and we pass the ball back and forth. Mm, mm, okay. So, and, and you've been working on things that start with the design and end someplace else. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit more about that. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we are interested right now in creating pieces that are what we call sort of design-based, but also um, that will be uh, interdisciplinary. So the idea of working uh, across disciplines is something that we're, we're very interested in. Um, also, because we saw it was a great opportunity to work with artists that we've always wanted to work with. But as a designer, because you're not initiating projects, you rarely get the chance to choose who you want to work with. You usually get chosen. Um, and so this was a chance where we said, okay, we want to do a bit of the choosing. There's artists that we want to bring something to their work or we'd like them to bring something to ours uh, and open that dialogue. And the current and kind of, we have some projects all spearhead and others that, that he'll kind of take the lead on. Um, our current sort of new development is called Moving Pictures. Um, and it, the idea is working with uh, photos that have been curated that come from uh, people who work in dance and in the arts. Uh, taking these photos and looking at them for um, a specific dramaturgical sort of potential and then taking that and then creating sound, movement, uh, spatial sort of uh, experiential rooms, the idea that, that an audience would get, uh, if it was a concrete event, would get a chance to go and experience uh, sort of different rooms based on mm -hmm. different photos or different notions. And so kind of trying to find out, right now that's where the research is. We're looking at, you know, tons and tons of images and trying to find out, okay, these 40 images, well, they're actually all saying the same thing. What we like is this specific movement or this specific uh, idea or notion or memory or mood. And then, okay, great. We can sum that up. And so we're kind of now developing sort of a picture archetype for all these sort of states we're looking at. That's fantastic. Yeah. And then in my own body of work right now, I'm working um, a lot with light bulbs. It's something that's been kind of a, a constant obsession of mine. Um, and so this idea of how uh, the light bulbs, actually how you can find, again, also in them, uh, dramaturgical possibilities. Mm. So this idea of working with uh, lamps in a much more sort of visual arts and sculpture um, direction. So what I'm doing is treating them with ink, wax, clay, tape, whatever I can find, and seeing how the properties of the light, which are the heat, not just the light that it emits, can transform these objects and how they can in turn make new uh, configurations or new images. Mm. Okay, so a couple of like more, uh, not rapid fire necessarily, but maybe like uh, yes, no, short answer kind yeah. of things. Um, so do you have a pet peeve in lighting design? Like people come in and are like, I don't know, I want this. And you're like, oh no, not that. 
I would say no, but when I see these things, I would say yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, do you see more people who come in with all kinds of ideas or more people who come in not knowing what to do and they need your direction? Um, more people that have no idea what the lighting for their show should look like. Okay. Yeah. Um, what, so you spoke a little bit earlier about kinds of things that a person could bring to a mm -hmm. designer. Uh, are there, like, if, if would you recommend, like, like if they were going to bring five things, can you think of five things that they might bring? Yeah, definitely bring images of inspiration, whether it's lighting or any sort of design in the show. Um, bring writings about the piece that you want to create, like, you know, there's no reason that your design team shouldn't have access to your grant proposal as well and read what you're saying that you'd like your show to be. You know, mm -hmm. that exercise is done and then it can kind of be shared within the team. Uh, so writing about the work, talking about the work, seeing images, um, drawing, all of those things would be great. Okay. Uh, is there, like, what is the worst lighting design either you've ever seen or that you've ever done that you like you just regret um <laughs> oh that's a good question uh i'd say the the worst i've ever done uh w was years ago but it was it was a show that we were doing in a garage <laughs> and we had very little lights and uh we had all kinds of external factors that made it hell to work on <laughs> Um, and one of them was actually that it was so cold in this garage, it was November, and the dimmers that our lighting was plugged into froze um, <laughs> the night of our dress rehearsal. Oh my gosh. And so I don't know what it was about that production, but I knew it didn't even look that good. And I thought it was ridiculous that we were working so hard to, to make something and that I should be proud of. But anyway, okay. it was a bit of a disaster. And is there something that you feel like, you know, so far is the best thing you've ever done? Design-wise? No. I mean, I, I definitely have a few shows that I'm really proud of, and obviously mm. they're the ones that usually find themselves on uh, your own portfolio or webpage. Mm. Um, but I'd say, yeah, I'd say whenever I feel that I've really connected, either with the choreographer, with the audience, or that when I look at the work, I've, I can feel that I've impressed myself or I've impressed my peers, other mm. designers, that for me is really the most gratifying Thing. like it's just uh, outstanding mm. Mm. okay and so this um, upcoming workshop at 303 when you started at the beginning of the week like what is your goal as the person who leads the workshop um, it's a great question my goal is usually um, it's really to demystify it. I want people to leave the course thinking that when they go see a show, they can they can ask themselves deeper questions about the lighting. They can look for signs of how things are made. Um, they can have a conversation with a designer, myself, anyone, and really uh, bring a bit more to the table as far as vocabulary. Um, understanding also how lighting is different from other design forms understanding how it can change a piece mm. um you know and we go quite in depth like i go i do a little bit on uh choosing designers working with designers finding designers you know this whole idea of also like how um um what are the tools that a designer would need what you are expected to like you said even like bring to a meeting with a designer um uh, yeah, I talk a lot about the process as well, the designer's process. So to demystify again, also this idea of like, what is that lighting designer doing from the time he goes to see the rehearsal to the time where you show up in the theater space, you know, there's a plan being made and there's choices of colors. There's all kinds of development of ideas. Hopefully if there's a residency, then you can even try things out physically. So this kind of idea of sh elaborating that process and showing examples of my own work of step by step how a show would evolve and so you could actually see and track how the design was made from base mm. maybe on just an image or just an idea or just a phrase and then it becomes a full design well i feel like i've learned a lot 
Great. <laughs> you won't need to do the course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. Well, no, I feel like now I feel like there's just like so many more other things that I want to learn. Um, so I really, I, I just appreciate so much that you did this. My pleasure. And um, I, I hope that everybody who listens really gets as much out of it as I just did. And um, yeah, the workshop is... Uh, starting November 30th at Studio 303 and uh, you can just go on the Studio 303 website and it's there under Atelier Pro and uh, you can check it out uh, and register uh, <laughs> I think we're full, actually. I think, we're, I think we're, we are full. The course is full. Yeah. Um, but for next year, there's, we do the course every year. So. Okay, well, that's perfect. So you can go on the website and uh, check it out and then mark your calendars for next year. <laughs> so, good. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. The Dirty Feet Podcast is produced and hosted by Produit et animé par Alison Burns J.D. Papillon et Stéphanie Morin-Robert We have Mainline Theatre, Montreal Improv Theatre and Paula Flalo to thank. Merci pour le soutien. Vous pouvez visiter notre site web, écouter les derniers épisodes, lire notre blog, nous aimer sur Facebook et nous suivre sur Twitter. You can visit our website, listen to past episodes, read our blog, like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Show us some love and help us spread the word. Montrez-nous un peu d'amour et aidez-nous à passer le mot.